Hi, welcome to equilibrium in a chemistry sense. You might be familiar with the idea of equilibrium in your own balance as you walk down the street, that if you have a good equilibrium, you won't fall over. In chemistry, it is similar to that, but it's written a little differently. Now, we've seen a lot of chemical equations. This is just using some symbols instead of elements. But the idea is that the N, M, N, M, X, and Y just mean coefficients, and A, B, C, and D are just meant to be chemicals, whether they are elements or compounds, not very relevant for us. What you might notice is in the center, this double pointed arrow, because what this is referring to is the fact that we have the forward reaction happening at the same time we have this reaction happening, what's called the reverse. So what we're looking at here is what's called an equilibrium. So in the beginning, concentrations of C and D are zero. We haven't made any products yet. Then after we've put our reactants together, they start making products, but then those products start reacting to make reactants. So this goes on and on until it reaches equilibrium. Now, there's this equilibrium expression. Don't worry, we're not going to be doing any of the math. But these come from the same parts up top. So the C and the D are meaning the products. X and the Y are the exponents for these. What this is generally saying is the idea that it's a ratio between what's going on with the products and what's going on with the reactants. So chemical equilibrium is the fact that you have the forward reaction and reverse reaction happening at the same rate. Now, it doesn't always exist. There's been many reactions you've seen me do in class, all the fiery things, the burning stuff going on. Those have all just been, um, what do you call them? Chemical reactions, not equilibrium reactions. Um, the reason why some of those exist is because of the fact that we have everything present in like a beaker to where these things can interact and again, make more and more of these. A lot of things in our body are equilibrium reactions because all of those different components are found in like our blood based upon having both the products and reactants in the same place. So now we kind of want to walk through of how two reactants react and reach equilibrium. So in the beginning, we have particle A, particle B, our reactants. This is the beginning. Nothing is formed yet. We have a lot of collisions between A and B because they're the only things present. The rate of forward reaction, the speed, is going to be very high. That's indicated by the big black arrow. Now, in the middle, products have formed. So we've made some products from our A and B. Collisions between the reactants decrease. So the amount of collisions in a second between these go lower because one, there's less of them than there used to be. And two, these are getting in the way. You're gonna have A and B colliding on occasion with C and D and kind of getting in the way. So the rate of forward reaction decreases compared to this. So it starts to slow down. The reverse reaction indicated by the little red starts to happen now more. Eventually, sometimes it takes minutes, hours, days, seconds, they're all different. The rate of forward reaction is equal to reverse. So we kind of model it with this double ended arrow. This is called dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic is just the phrase or term that this is happening, you know, reactants to products and products to reactants are happening at the same time. The amounts of everything remains constant. So if we were to follow A and B and kind of like pick a couple molecules to follow, we would actually see that they do make C and D but then they make C and D back to A and B over time. This constantly is reacting both at the same time. That's what chemical equilibrium really is. 
So here's another model of it in a different reaction. So here we have some reactants, some ions, and that these ions are going to collide and make some product. The product is also going to decay or break apart, decompose, and break some more of the reactants. And that these are both happening at the same speed. So this is going, you know, forward. Oops. I don't know, 15 times a second. And this is also happening at 15 times a second. Those are just arbitrary numbers, nothing definitive, but the idea is that they're equal. So this is also happens when things evaporate. So as things evaporate, things also condense down into the liquid. So the rate in a closed container is the same. Now, in a chemical reaction, we have a whole bunch of things. But remember that equilibrium expression? I told you we're not going to calculate this guy. You don't put everything present there. Solids and liquids do not get placed in there. They have no effect on the way equilibrium works. Because they don't have a concentration, they have a set amount. So we're going to disregard solids and liquids in the chemical reactions we come across. So that plays a big role. Keep that in mind. I'll remind you numerously. With equilibrium reactions, we follow a principle to determine which way the reactants are going to move or change if we do something to them. This is called Le Chatelier's principle. He was a French guy. So as a little reminder, not all reactions are reversible. But when they are, you'll see this double arrow, or you'll see kind of like you saw before, a forward reaction and a reverse reaction. So you'll see those kind of double arrows. And we're going to focus on those for this unit. Remember the idea that the forward reaction rate, the speed at which the forward reactants to products is equal to the products becoming the reactants. So if we were to look at this graph, from when we start the reaction, the forward reaction slows down and the reverse reaction speeds up until they're equal. If we were to look at how much of each we have, at the start of the reaction, we have a whole bunch of reactants and no products. The reactants get used, so they decrease. Products get made, so they increase, until there's no change in the amount of each. That's how we know we're at equilibrium. Okay. However, you can move equilibrium if you do what's called a stress. A stress is essentially a change. Then you get a new equilibrium to minimize that stress. So that's what we're going to look on the next few slides to see how does pressure, uh, concentration, and temperature shift these in order to, for us to determine how much products we want to get. So the first type of stress we'll look at is a change in pressure. Pressure only affects gases. So anything that's solid, liquid, or aqueous in a, in a chemical equation is being just ignore. We're only going to focus on the gases. Now, the example I have here is gases only. But this is the way we'll look at these. It's only gases. So when we have an increase in pressure, that's going to force the particles closer together. So because of that occurring, when you have a oops, increase in pressure, that's going to shift it towards fewer moles of gas. So when I look on the left side of my little equation here, I have four total moles of gas, one for the nitrogen, three for the hydrogen. Over here, I have only two for the NH3. So if I were to increase the number, I'm sorry, increase the pressure, that would shift towards the products. More products are going to be made. And this is because we're going to increase the rate at which the four particles are going to collide because they're going to be closer together. If we decrease the pressure, then that's going to go towards <coughs> more 
moles of gas. So that's going to shift it the other way. So that decrease in pressure is going to go shift towards there. So if we look back at here, a decrease in pressure is going to shift it towards the larger amount of moles. So a decrease will shift towards reactants because of the fact that now we're going to be using up more of this NH3 to make more of these reactants. So this will play a role when we want to try to make how much products because we want to shift it always towards the products. So as a little recap, increasing the pressure or pushes it towards fewer moles of gas only. Decrease in pressure is towards more moles of gas. Something good for a note card. Next, we're looking at concentration. Now, concentration only affects gases and aqueous solutions. So I can kind of disregard this barium sulfate solid in my determination looking at things. So an increase in concentration depends on which one I'm increasing. So if I were to highlight, I'm gonna use that in blue, if I were to increase the concentration of barium chloride, that would be away from the substance. So I now have more of this, so it's going to shift it towards the products. Just like think, if I had more reactants, I can now make more products. So an increase for this barium chloride, or also label here, any increase here is going to shift to the products, which makes sense. If you have more reactants, you can now make more products. Change my color here. If I were to increase the amount of sodium chloride, I don't like using the, let me undo that there. If I were to erase this here, there we go. So if I were to increase the amount for sodium chloride, now I would have more products to make more reactants. So that would shift to the reactants. Now, this can also be true if we decrease concentration. So if we, I'll use green, decrease either one of the reactants, now there's less reactants to make product. So it's going to shift it towards the reactant side. Oops. So when we decrease, it goes towards that substance we just decreased. Because again, need to make, need to produce more of the substance to make up for what was removed. So again, you can see this little chart being very handy when we think of these different ways it will shift. So when we think of temperature, we think of temperature as heat. And so what we have up top is what's called a thermochemical equation. It's a chemical equation with therm in it. You might be thinking of therm like thermal or thermometer. And both of those are talking about energy or heat. So you can see we've added energy. In this case, it is produced when these two things react. So energy is found on the product side. Energy is sometimes found on the reactant side, but we can still think of which way it would shift when temperature is changed. So when we have an increase in temperature of everything, it's going to move away from the heat. So, or slash energy. So energy is a product. So an increase in temperature is going to shift it to the reactant side in this case. If energy was on the left side, it's going to shift it towards the products. So it's going to always shift it away from wherever the energy is. Because again, extra energy and heat must be used up in order to make that go back to the way it was. Likewise, if we decrease the temperature, cool things down in this case, 
it's going to go towards the energy. So that means we're going to move towards the energy to make more products because the energy again needs to be produced to be made up for the loss. So it's going to be made by making more of the products. So again, this can be very handy to have on your note card so you understand which way is which. All right, so now that we have all of these together, let's practice a little bit. So we're going to use our equation, same one on your sheet, and try to determine, have you guess which way it's going to shift? I'll give the y, okay? So first one, if we added an H3, which way do you think it would shift? It would shift towards the, oops, it would shift towards the reactant side. The reason is there's more product particles to collide. So therefore the forward reaction rate, I'm sorry, the reverse reaction rate would increase and therefore shift it towards the reactants. Try removal of NH of N2. That would shift it again towards the reactants. There's now less N2 present, so the forward reaction rate, this happening this way, is going to happen less. This is still going to happen at the same rate. So it's going to look like more of N2 and H2 are going to be formed. What about an increase in pressure? That's going to shift it towards the reactants. Shifting towards, I'm sorry, towards the products. And that's because an increase in pressure will always shift towards the smaller amount of moles of gas. If they're equal, you know, if you have four on the left and four on the right, there'll be no shift, no shift at all. What about a decreased temperature? That'll shift it towards the products. Shift towards the products because as heat is removed, just like when we remove a product, more of that energy is going to need to be produced. So these are going to produce the energy by reacting more in the forward reaction towards the products. Removal of H2. Same way as removal of N2 was, for the same reason. We now decreased the number of hydrogen present. So the forward reaction can't happen as much as the reverse reaction can happen, which the overall change is towards the reactants. How about decrease pressure? You probably guessed correctly, opposite of increased pressure. And that's because of the fact that the number of particles is higher on the reactant side. So decrease in pressure shifts towards the lower number of gas particles on either side. Addition of a catalyst. No change. And that's because of the fact that forward and reverse reaction rates happen equally higher. So there's no overall change aside from equilibrium getting to it faster. Last one, increased temperature. You probably guessed that, right? The opposite of decreased temperature in this case. So the fact that since there's more energy on the product side, that's now going to make more reactants occur. So that's why it's going to shift towards the reactants. All right, so even though we were shifting it towards the reactants or shifting it towards the products, we want to make sure that it goes really to make more product because that's what we're trying to produce. We don't really want our reactants. If we did, we wouldn't react them together. So we want to look at how could we change anything with pressure, temperature, and the amounts of either of these to shift towards getting more products. Remember that's 
to the right. So the first thing we're going to look at is pressure. Now, pressure does not affect solids. It only affects gases. We have zero moles on the left and one mole on the right. So if we wanted to shift it, we would want to decrease pressure because decreasing pressure would always shift towards the higher amount of moles, which in this case would be to the right. That's what we're trying to get to. Temperature we have on the left side. So if we want to shift it towards the products, we would need to increase temperature because that would be adding more energy. And if we have more energy as a reactant, we can make more products. The amounts of reactants and products, well, solids don't play a role. So those would have no change if we added or subtracted some. So because we have as a product, we'd want to decrease the amount of CO2 from the situation, like pulling it out. And that would actually produce more CO2 from the original calcium carbonate. So a decrease in pressure, increase in temperature, and a decrease or removal of CO2 would help make more and more products. Let's take a look at the next one. Looking at pressure, we have two moles of gas on the left, zero on the right. So if I wanted to have pressure help me out here, I would increase pressure because an increase in pressure is going to go towards the lower number of moles. If I want to look at temperature, I've got energy on the right side. So I'd want to decrease temperature in order to make more of that energy. And again, we're shifting it to the right. The amounts of reactants and products, I'm going to highlight them more over here. Eh, maybe say red. We want to increase our amount of reactants. More reactants means the more products. And I'd want to decrease, oh, actually, I almost goofed there. Because this is a liquid, that doesn't play any role. So that's not going to be affected at all. So we'd want to increase our amounts of hydrogen and chlorine to make more products. Now for our last one, we have three moles of gas on the left, two moles of gas on the right. So again, if I want to shift it towards the products, I want to shift and make more CO2, I would need to increase the pressure because that'll force the three to become two. It always goes towards the lower number of moles by an increase in pressure. Just like in the second example, because I have the energy on the product side, I'd want to decrease the temperature. That would make more of my energy being made, again, shifting it to the right. Now, the last thing is the amounts of products and reactants. So we always want to include increasing our reactants that are included. Remember, you wouldn't use a solid or liquid, just our gases and aqueous. And we'd want to, what did I use before? Oh, maybe I'll use blue. Decrease our amount of CO2, because if I pull that off, then that can't be made into reactants again. So these are the ways we'd want to manipulate it to always force it to make products so we can control these equilibrium reactions to produce maximum products, which is often what we're trying to do. Come in with any kind of questions and I hope to see you soon. Take care.